So I know that Wes and Les took a moment at the beginning just to say thank you to everyone who came to serve. But I get, you know how, I don't know, maybe they're not my kids, but you know how when you get just happy and excited about something that people that you're kind of developing or doing. And I just want you to know that as good as this platform looks, Georgia and Naomi have just rocked it out this week. They have made it. These girls are bringing it. They have made it look so lovely. And I'm just so thankful for the privilege to have them on the team. That is not all that they bring. In fact, next week, we're doing something really incredible at Mosaic. We are doing something that as far as I know we've never done and we are having four speakers over Isaiah 9 taking five minutes over a particular piece of that scripture and next week Georgia happens to be on that list. So this week she decorated, next week she preaches. That's the way it is. That's the way I like it. So there's also three other incredible speakers you're not going to want to miss out on. It's going to be a really neat opportunity. Right before I get started, I just want to just share with you real quick something you may have seen today. Uh, and I know we're giving you a lot of information, but it is the Christmas season, and so we have a lot going on. But today you may have received this, and you may be asking, what does this look like? When I arrived here, one of the things that Pastor Gary and I discussed was that we had a real desire to be a multi-generational church. I have preached in a lot of places, and one of the things that's probably the most tragic is when a church no longer is able to be sustaining and to grow into the next because its generation never transferred. They never learned the principle of transference to generation to generation. The problem with that is, is that it's very unbiblical. The Bible is really clear that one of the greatest strategies of heaven on multiplying the goodness of God in the earth through people is through generational transfer. It's learning how to do it well. That's why the enemy attacks it so much. It's an attack because it is one of the most biblical things you can do. The Bible says that Abraham was given what Abraham was given, not because he was just an incredible man or just because he was righteous in his own eyes. If you read back in Genesis, the Bible says that God chose Abraham because he knew he could trust him to pass what was in his life to the next generation. He knew he would talk to the next generation about who he was. And that's why God entrusted him with the wealth that he did. That's why God gave him the visions that he did, because he could trust him to the next. And one of the things that we want to make sure we do at Mosaic is that we're entrusting and that we are worthy of carrying on to the next generation. So that means that we're not ever looking at two-year-olds and saying they don't belong. We're never looking at 15-year-olds and saying you don't, you'll figure it out when you're 50. We believe that every person plays a role at Mosaic Church. Now, when I was growing up, we had the great privilege of doing a lot of incredible things as a youth member and as a, and as a child, but they've come a long way since the youth camps that I attended. I got in more trouble and had more write, writings home, and I was put on a plane one time. I've apologized, guys. Let it go. My youth pastors, I was not their favorite character. Back then, you know, you were only allowed to listen to Christian music in the bus, and um, I had a... I think my problem wasn't the Christian music, it was that I didn't like being told what to do. And they said, you can only listen to Christian music, and back then they only had a cassette player, and uh, they had just come out with what they called a walkie-talkie, you know, or like a Walkman, like a Walkman. And so I had a Walkman with a cassette, and it, it was ACDC. Now some of you will know what that is, because that's an 80s, 90s thing, but, but I had this ACDC uh, nice little tape, and I, I got to the meeting the week before we were supposed to leave on camp, and they said to us, they said, well, you can only have Christian music on, on this camp, so anything that's not Christian, you can't bring along. Apparently, they thought if we listened to only Christian music, we'd be more godly by the time we got there. And, um, and I, I started a secret petition among everyone that night to revolt, but that if all of us did it collectively, they couldn't throw all the Walkmans out. Well, to say the least, it worked, and then I got a ride home from that camp. <laughs> My dad drove me back, and I had to write a nice little letter to every youth leader. It was really humbling. But to say the least, ACDC never left the Walkman. So I don't know who won. 
But anyway, we believe in our kids and we want to bless them. And one of the ways that you can help us bless them is helping them to go to camp this next year. So 2022 has finally opened back up to us. Now, some of you may say, well, I've got my own kids to sponsor and that's beautiful. That's fine. We understand that. Others of you are in grandparent stage or you don't have children, but yet you still want to invest in the next generation. This is a great way to do that. So on your seat today, you may have found this pledge card. Now, this isn't about who has the emotional most pledges. This is about your contribution and what you can give. Every pound you give will go to helping make sure a child gets to camp that's unable to have gotten there without your support. So what that will mean is, is that this week you take this with you. On the 19th or next week, whichever one suits you best, depending on whether or not you're here, you can bring this back with your pledge amount. You don't have to have the money in hand at that moment, but your pledge is just going to help us be able to calculate how many kids we can sponsor and how many we can begin to make room for. We want every child that is here in the right age bracket to be able to go to camp this year. I don't want any kids left out. I make light of what Cam did in one way, but I will tell you it transformed my life. I'll never forget being at the altar at 13 years old and the Holy Spirit speaking to me and telling me you're going to go all over the earth preaching the gospel. It's in you to do it. I had never seen women preachers up to that point besides very few that were doing what I believed God had spoke to me at 13 years old. And it made a major impact. I can tell you where it was. I can't tell you the day I got saved because I think I got saved a thousand times. But I can tell you the day I got called. I can tell you the day I got called. I can tell you exactly where I was at. So I want you to help us sponsor a kid. Amen. You ready to do that? All right. You ready to jump into the word today? All right. It's Advent season, and I love that. Why don't you turn with me to Matthew chapter 2? Now, I love Advent for several reasons, and I'm going to take a minute and, and unpack some things. But as a pastor, it's always fun to unpack Christmas the next year because everybody always comes into church going, oh, I already heard that. I already know that. But I'm hoping that God illuminates us once again. How many of you know you can go back to the Word, read the same Scripture a thousand times to get something new? I can. I get something new. And I, I've really involved myself this year to say, God, I want to hear you fresh about Advent. I want you to speak to me afresh. The first thing God did is He convicted me. And He said, Amanda, Advent isn't a season, it's a lifestyle. Advent isn't a season, it's a lifestyle. The only reason we have a season for it is because we have a reason to have a season. We, we call it the birth of Jesus. He said, but I'm always wanting to birth new things in your life. I'm always wanting to birth in infancy the plans and the purposes I have. So I want to take us on a little bit of a journey that I hope builds the expectancy in us that this isn't just about a season. This is about going somewhere new in God letting God take us to a new place in him. And I'm just going to use scriptures that we're familiar with to do it. So if you're in Matthew chapter 2, would you stand with me for the reading of the word? Matthew chapter 2. I'm going to read all the way through, starting in verse 1, and then we'll, uh, we'll see what God has to say. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the day of Herod, the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been king, born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he inquired of them, Where is the Christ to be born? They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus, thus it is written by the prophet. But you, Bethlehem, and the Lamb of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men to himself, determined from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go search and carefully find the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me, and then I will go worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy, and when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother. They fell down and worshipped him, and when they had opened their treasures, they presented the gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, and then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. 
Lord, thank you for the ability to preach and teach today. Thank you for your word that's illuminating and that is giving light. I thank you that you'll put me on like a coat today and wear me. Let my voice be an oracle from heaven. Lord, I thank you for the privilege to communicate your word. I'm asking you for unlocked ears and open hearts to receive what only you can deposit. And may the transformation in every person be to your glory and to the manifestation of your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. You may be seated. If I was going to give a title today to my particular message, this is what I would call it, Wisdom from Unexpected Places. Wisdom from unexpected places. Now, the reason I want to talk about this is because I want to set some things up. The first things I want to do is I want to defunct some things that we believe that are not actually doctrinal. Number one, we don't know how many wise men there were. Number one. So whenever you're singing We Three Kings, it's an excellent song, but it is not biblically accurate. So whenever we come into situations like this, it's good for us to have an understanding of the scriptures as a whole. We don't know how many wise men they were. We don't know exactly where they were from. And we don't know exactly how long it took for them to get where they were going. We have some guesses that they came from Persia or from what would have been considered Babylon. One of the reasons that we believe that is because Daniel was also considered a wise man or a magi in his time to those that he served as a king. And we believe that most likely Daniel had passed along what God was saying in a heavenly way to those that were not even followers of God at that time. And throughout tradition, these people had held on to eventually there was one coming because we all know that other than any other prophet in all of the Old Testament, Daniel was the most to prophesy about what it would look like in a new world with Jesus. He was one that saw into a world that we had yet discovered or experienced. That's why he was beloved and hated all at the same time. He didn't just interpret dreams. He was able to bring interpretation to something where information only resided. That's what makes someone wise. What makes someone wise is when they no longer seek information, they seek interpretation. That's why Google.com can give you information, but it doesn't necessarily ever give you interpretation. What separates someone from being full of knowledge and able to move ahead in knowledge and someone who can move ahead in wisdom is that they seek the interpretation of something and not just the information of something. One of the greatest tragedies in the house of God today is that people are full of information. We are great at bringing information to people. We are excellent at TED Talks. We are excellent at telling people the how-tos of do whatever it is they need to do to get over whatever it is they're going through or how to make their, su their success from good to great. But sometimes what we're missing the most that can only come from the house of God is is the interpretation of what it takes to get from there to there. And one of the things that separates us when we're talking about the men that come to Jesus is that they came not seeking information. They came seeking the very interpretation of who God was in the earth. The sign that they saw in a star was never to bring them to a place of safety. It was never to stop their journey. It was never to be conclusive. It was always the continuation of a journey they were supposed to take. That's what I love about studying scripture is that sometimes we don't know where the people came from. We don't know how many they were. We don't know how long it took. But what we do have is a story that helps us see something greater than what we could see on our own. Ephesians chapter 5 tells us that you can observe wisdom. Let me tell you three things about operating in wisdom. The first one is, is that wisdom is pure. The Bible says wisdom is pure. Above all things, it operates in purity. That means that whenever wisdom is present, it has no ulterior motives. Its motive is always to bring out the best of whatever is happening. It is never in the favor of one or the other. It's always in the favor of what God is saying. It's always in favor of the best option in the room. It's always in favor of the truth being magnified. So when you're talking about being a wise person, being a wise person is not having the best strategy. Strategy, being a wise person is having the God strategy. Because the God strategy is not always the best strategy. In the natural. In the natural, there's been lots of times that it did not make sense to go to war with only 300 people. In the natural, it doesn't make sense that a man will live with lions one night and come out the next night and be second in command. 
In the natural, it doesn't make sense how one guy's in prison one day goes and shaves, ends up in the palace the next day. In the natural, those were not the best scenarios, but they were the very nature of wisdom operating. God allows us to operate in wisdom when we operate out of a pure place without ulterior motives. So whenever you want wisdom present on the job, when you want wisdom present in your life, you want wisdom present in your marriage, you have to learn how to walk in it purely. Not in what it is you want out of it, but what is it that God wants out of it. That's what causes your ability to become humble in a place that maybe sometimes you're still even in charge. Maybe you were right and they were wrong, but your humility will allow you to come to the best place because your wisdom trumps your your particular place of rightness. Proverbs chapter 8 and 9, of course, the whole book of Proverbs deals so much with wisdom. In fact, we call it the wisdom book. It's full of wisdom about the things that are necessary components in order to operate in the world. And this is one of the things that I love about the personification that is magnified in those two particular chapters. It says, I was present, this is wisdom talking, I was present before the foundations of the world. In other words, between, before God even looked at chaos and brought it into order, he created and manifested wisdom. That means every area of our life, we have to have wisdom in order to operate in any sense of chaos. Every place that's out of order in your life, most of the problem is not anything, it's not money, it's not a better job, it's not a better family, it's not a more uh, conclusive husband or wife. What would make your life better is if you have better wisdom. Because wisdom is a principled thing. So not only is wisdom pure, wisdom is something you observe. Ephesians 5, chapter 5, verse 5 tells us that it is an observable thing. Be wise like those you watch. That's what the Bible says. Be wise like those you watch. So whenever you want to operate in wisdom, you don't just have to apply wisdom. You have to learn how to get around wise people. Do you know what that also means? If you can observe wisdom... You can also observe not so wisdom. Sometimes the boss you worked for last year, it was not about putting you through the ringer. It was about you getting wise about what you should not do in business practices. Because wisdom is something that you can glean from someone else. Out of all the attributes of God, he does not say to you that he will just multiply everything in your life at any given point. The Bible says he is your peace. He says he is your love. He says that he is your goodness. But he never says to you that if you pray for all of these things, that he's just going to multiply them without end. But he does say, if you pray for wisdom, it will be given to you multiplied time and time again. So there is something that can be multiplied in your life above everything else, and that is wisdom. So when you're operating in wisdom, not only is it pure, not only is it observable, but it's also rooted in the fear of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 1 says that when you fear God, it is the beginning of all wisdom. Now let me explain this to you because we don't like to use this type of terminology today. Because when we use terminology like fear of the Lord, we all get, ooh, what does that mean? We need to return back to some knowledge about what it means to really fear God. Because listen, the fear of the Lord is righteous. There is a healthy fear you and I are supposed to have. It is not fear of man. It is not fear of our inability to finish well. It is not fear of us falling apart. It's not fear of us falling down and not being able to get back up. The fear that we're supposed to have is the fear that when we get into the presence of God, when we are operating representing God, when we're in our everyday life, that we are operating in a place of realizing that everything I do, every word I say, every coffee I order, every meeting I have is a representation of how I am representing him. He has put me on assignment to be his billboard in the earth. My fear is not of people, but I do have a healthy fear that the day that I stand before the Lord that he'll be able to say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. It matters to me that when I show up at the pearly gates that what God is able to say to me isn't, good job, Amanda, you did a lot of awesome things in the earth. You preached a lot of great sermons. You went to a lot of places and gave away a lot of food. You took clothing here and you clothe these people but none of it I assign to you I fear God enough that it creates in me a wisdom to know what I'm supposed to do when 
when wisdom's operating in your life, you may not have the outcome, but you will always have the initiation to go into what it is God has assigned to you. That is why you have the ability to walk in unknown places and still be wise in them. It is not because you have everything figured out. It is because you have a healthy fear of the Lord to where in that fear of God, it is creating in you an ability to be able to walk in unknown places and yet at the same time be wise in everything you're doing. Because wisdom is the fear of God. So when we're talking about this, there's something interesting that comes up in, in this particular verse in Matthew chapter 2 because you may have read it as magi, but if you'll read it in modern translations, the Bible says that these were wise men. Now I find that interesting because nowhere else in Scripture are they referred to as wise men except in the book of Daniel and this particular book. So what that means to us is, is that God is giving us an understanding that you need to pay attention by observing what it is they did. Because if you can observe it, there's some things you can catch. So I want to talk about three things today that I think we can catch from the unexpected people that God chose to bring us a story we don't have completion on. We don't understand it all, but we have enough of it to be able to apply to some areas of our life. Here's the first one. The first one is, is that when you want to operate in wisdom and be wise in your, own, in your own life, you have to learn to operate out of the questions that they asked. Here's the thing. Their questions revealed their expectation. When you look back in Matthew 2, verse 2, it says, when they came to Jerusalem, the epicenter, that they looked at every major force and said, where is he, the one born king of the Jews? They never said, where is the child? They never said, where is this baby that I've been told about? They never said, where can I find an infant? Their question revealed their expectation. They were not on the lookout for a baby. They were not looking for a child. They were looking for a king. Something in you and I's life that if we could grab it, it would change our life. If we could learn to ask the right questions, your questions will always reveal your true expectation. Everything in the question was, I'm looking for the king who I have heard about. I've seen his star, and now I'm looking. About 10 years ago, I was in a meeting, and it was an incredible meeting, and I was sitting in the room similar to this, actually. There was a big balcony, and I was invited to this very, I would use the word posh, this very posh meeting. And all these pastors and leaders were there, and, and they had come to this prayer time. And, and this lady gets up on the prayer time. She's very, very well known. And, and she said, right now I see angelic activity. And she began to talk about the angelic activity that she saw. And, and I, I have to be honest with you, I was sitting there, and I was a bit puzzled for a moment because I was thinking, hmm, I'm not spiritual enough, clearly, because I see none of this angelic activity. I mean, everything that's going on in the room, I'm pretty sure I don't see. And she was describing the, the angels and what was happening. And, and don't hear me wrong, I was really, I, I knew she was being truthful and she was sharing specifically. And all of a sudden, another woman came up and she said, I have a word that goes on that word. And she began to describe other things that were taking place in the room. And though my heart bore witness with it, I wasn't seeing what they were seeing. And when I got back to my hotel room that night, to be quite honest, I was really frustrated with God because one of the ways that God uses me is, is through discernment or prophetic insight. So I was a little annoyed with God that here were these people seeing things in the atmosphere of the room that clearly I was missing and I could not figure out a God who doesn't withhold while he was withholding from me. That's what I wanted to know. So I, I'll never forget it because I was laying on the floor and I was crying out to God and I said, God, I don't know that I want to see angels, but I want to know why I couldn't. And the Lord said to me, it's really simple, Amanda. You don't see them because you've never asked to. You've never asked that question. Your expectation has never been set for you to see anything more than what you see. So I'm never going to show you something that doesn't meet the expectation of what you want me to do. I will always bring more to you, but I will always require your expectation to meet the demand you put on me. Here's what I've learned. These men, they asked a question, but their question revealed their true expectation. 
their expectation was they were interested in finding the king. They weren't interested in just finding something else. They weren't interested in finding another baby. They weren't interested in finding just another piece of royalty. They were interested in finding the king. Where can I go to find him? Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 is one of the most familiar Christmas scriptures that we have. But just to focus on one little piece of it for just a minute. The Bible says at the beginning of verse 6, For unto us a child is born. For unto us a son is given. Do you want to know the difference in right there? The first one is natural. For unto us a child is born. It was a natural prophetic word. It was a word to help you know naturally what was taking place. I'm bringing a child to the planet. But the second one was a discernible spiritual position. You may in the natural only see a child coming to the earth, but I'm giving a son. And here is what Isaiah was saying. Isaiah was saying in chapter 9, verse 6, he was saying to some on the day that he arrives, he will only be a child that's made it to the planet. Nothing more and nothing less. No more expectation than anyone else. But to others, he will be the son that I gave. Because to those who have the ability to have a greater expectation and a larger place of discernment and operate in wisdom, they will see the things that others refuse to see. Do you want to know something this week, right now in Coventry, right now where you're at, on your job, there are things that God wants to do. They might even be naturally in alignment with a spiritual word. But if you are not careful, you will get the natural interpretation right. You will interpret naturally correctly about what God is doing. But you will miss the spiritual connotation of what God is trying to say. He was not interested in just naturally telling us a child was coming. He was interested in letting us know that there was a son who had been given. That when he gave something, it meant you needed it. It meant he had more more in it than just the gift itself. It meant that who he was was coming to the planet and that changes everything. Your questions reveal your expectation. Number two, their journey forward was blessed with supernatural provision. Now this is one of my favorite points that I have never seen actually in this scripture until I studied it this particular past couple of weeks. In Numbers chapter 24, verse 17, there's a prophetic word that comes out by a prophet named Balaam. Balaam prophesies in this particular verse, you can go back and read it on your own. He prophesies actually in his third prophecy something about Jesus that we've never applied. This is what he basically says, you can go back for your own translation, but he says this, a star is rising out of Judah who will break the back of those who are enslaved. A star is rising out of Judah. Now, I looked at that and I thought, I wonder what that coordinates and parallels with what it means to have supernatural provision. Because I found the star that led all of the wise men forward to find Jesus such an intriguing part of this story that I don't know very many people who have set up camp around. But when I began to research what the star could have been, of course, people have all types of ideas on what this star could have been. But where I want to land on is when you look at the interpretation in the Hebrew and in the Greek, when you go back to this particular verse in Numbers and then you compare it again to the cloud by day and the fire by night that's mentioned also in Numbers and Exodus, when you go back to all of those places, it carries the same root word as Shekinah glory. This is what I want to bring around in point number two. Anytime you begin a search for God, he will bring you the glory that's necessary to get to him so that you have the fullness of the glory in you. The Bible says that the Shekinah glory went before and it went after the children of Israel. In this particular case, why would God bring Shekinah glory to people who seemingly didn't even know him? Do you know what my answer to that is? He brought it because they were willing to search for him. They were looking for the fullness that only he could bring. But in the reality, God knew that if I bring my glory in the steps that you need it, it will lead you, it will guide you, it will position you, so that when you arrive to me, everything that is in you becomes alive through you. 
Do you want to know what the Shekinah glory did? The Shekinah glory does several things. Have you ever heard of this? Have you ever heard of the Shekinah glory? Anybody in here? You ever heard that? And if, you're, if you were saved in the 80s, you probably heard it a lot. I don't want to take away, though, from biblical words that actually have place in today's society. This is really important to me, that we learn how to how to to dwell in both the ancient and the new how we learn how to pull out of both the treasure box of the ancient and the new that's what takes an incredible pastor or preacher today to be able to pull from those when we're talking about Shekinah glory it we're talking about a weightiness that comes for direction giving that's what Shekinah glory does it comes to bring a weightiness that helps us to understand who we are in the room and who we are not in the room that's why you know when someone stands up on a platform and says the glory of the Lord is here and everybody's standing and staring at them, that the glory of the Lord ain't there. It may be a prophecy, but it's not reality. Because when the glory of the Lord is resident in a house, you will not believe you are worthy of standing. The, the Bible tells us that when Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple, that the only response Isaiah could have was to touch his lips and to call himself unclean. Here was a prophet who had been a prophet for many years, who had been one that had been used by God for many years, but the only thing he could do when he saw the Lord was get on his face and repent and bring himself to a reality that everything he had just seen wasn't nearly as good as who God really was. Because when the glory resides in a place, everyone gets sized up on who they really are in the room. One of the reasons that made these men wise that we can learn from is that they never cowered under the glory, but they also never tried to drive the glory. They let it lead them. One of the greatest tragedies in modern Christendom is that we have tons of people praying for revival their way. We have many people who want to see other people come to Christ their way. They're interested in driving God's glory instead of letting the glory of God lead them. What made them wise is that they were provided for on the search with a glory that not only revealed to them their placement, but it brought to them direction. It gave them directional insight. Do you want to know why the glory wants to be restored in the earth? It is not just about us having great services, incredible times of healing. I'm not discrediting any of that. It is all so important. But that is not why God wants to bring his glory. God wants to bring his glory so he can set the direction for his house. So that once again, he is not being driven out or driven according to his miracle working power on our behalf. But that his miracle working power works on his behalf. It drives you by leading you to the king. Every miracle is never stationary. No matter how small a miracle, if it only leads you to worship the miracle, you missed it. Every miracle is mobile. It's always leading you to him. Only John in the book of John is the only one who refers to miracles as signs. He said it is a sign that when you receive a miracle in your life, that it's always pushing you to something else. So when we talk about God supernaturally providing, he provided them to know who they were in the room and the direction they needed to get where they were going. I'm, I began, when I began to read that this week, I had never seen that before. And I began to ask the Lord, Lord, in this Christmas season, every single week, let us get closer to experiencing what it means to be led by your glory once again. Where every week it's not just about song lists and showing up and whether or not we'll come or we won't come. But let us have such an ability to walk out and say, I'm on the search, I'm going to do it, and God, show yourself so that you can give the direction that's necessary. Because listen, you and I aren't smart enough to do the things that are necessary in the earth today without his help. We will not have the strategies without his help. People getting saved do not just get saved because of good services. They may come to a meeting because of a good service, but the Bible says only a transformed life can happen by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we need his glory to lead us. They were men who understood how to walk behind the glory. Now I want to just 
make, is this okay? Are you, is this all right? You catching it? I hope you're catching it. Sometimes you got to catch some stuff. That's what I'm hoping you're doing today. I hope you're catching it. You say, well, I don't know how the glory applies to my Tuesday. <laughs> I'll tell you how. When you learn how to see something in a distance of darkness that only God could do, one little glimmer, if you'll start being led by it, God will continue to illuminate it in your life. And eventually, it becomes the glory of the Lord operating in you. The key is, don't get ahead of it. That's the key. The key is, don't get ahead of it. Because you see it where you want to go. You don't get there before the star gets there first. Listen, they had the directional plan on where they wanted to go. Technically, they did not need a star. They had already been told to go to Bethlehem. Why did a star come if they didn't really need it unless it was about a provision about them learning the pace of the Spirit? You don't get to go in your time frame to where you want to go. You walk behind me. You go in my time frame. Some of you are looking for promotion on your job and you're aggravated with God over why you don't have it yet. My question to you is, are you walking behind the glory or are you trying to outpace God in front of him? Are you trying to make God do what you need him to do? Or are you willing to walk in rhythm with him? Because God's rhythm never disappoints. It never disappoints. You can get yourself ahead of God and out of your grace by your own ambition. These wise men knew their job well. If they didn't, they would have never shown themselves in Jerusalem. But what separated them is that they didn't just know their job. They knew when to yield themselves to someone's greater power in this particular case. Number three. So number one, we know that in order for us to operate in a place of wisdom, we have to understand that our questions are something that build expectation. The second one is we got to know there's supernatural provision of his glory wherever the direction he's sending us. And here's the third one. When they show up at the house where Jesus is, the Bible says that their response revealed their belief system. Now here's what I want to tell you. Whatever it is in your life that you get finally and you reach your end point of whatever it is you're believing God for, whatever it is your journey's taking you on, if when you get there, your response isn't these men's response, then you have missed why God brought you there. The Bible says their response revealed their belief system. As soon as they arrived, they did two things. The first one was they bowed low. They got on their face. They knew who they were in the room. But the second one was they opened their treasure box. They had a response, but their response was in alignment with what they believed. There's two ways you believe. Some of you would say, well, I have a doctrine. Well, I'd like to just defunct something really quick as we're making the turn here. And here's why. Because some of us have been taught that doctrine is something we agree to when we come into a church. That's not wrong in principle. We do share a doctrine. It's important that we share this doctrine. But there's something further. It's called orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is what you believe. It is the doctrine you believe. Being orthodox is not wrong. It is simply indicating something you believe. Every one of us have an orthodoxy in our life. We have a doctrine we live by. We have a belief system that we make decisions from and that we respond from. But the other one is orthoproxy. Orthoproxy is actually how you live out in practice the doctrine of orthodoxy in your life. When these men showed up to Jesus, when they got to their end point, their immediate reaction was to first say, God, I need to worship you. And then their second reaction was to say, I brought things to you. Here's why we're told that they brought gold and frankincense and myrrh. Maybe you know all of this and you'll just give me the next five minutes to help you understand a little bit further. But here's why they brought that. Gold represented kingliness. No one would ever come to another king and not bring something gold. It was a precious metal that could never go. It could never tarnish. It was always a kingly gift. 
But the second one that he brought was frankincense. Some of you may not know much about frankincense. One day I hope to, to carry out a sermon series here that helps us understand each one of these elements and how they, they make up the aroma of heaven. But for this instance, frankincense comes from a tree. It is something that was burned on top of the sacrifices in the Old Testament. Every wood sacrifice would have had a sprinkling of frankincense upon it. So that when it burned, the aroma of that frankincense lifted to heaven. It was given to Jesus because it was to represent the priestly anointing on his life. He was given gold to represent the kingly anointing. He was given frankincense to represent the priestly anointing. And he was given myrrh to represent his death. What he was going to do on the earth. This is what the Bible says, and I've talked a little bit about myrrh a few weeks ago, but the Bible says that myrrh is bitter in taste, but the sweetest of all smells. So though when you taste it, it is bitterness, when you smell it, it is sweet. God the Father said of the Son that his death was like a sweet aroma that was lifted to heaven. It was a sweet-smelling sacrifice. But the son said of himself, if this cup of bitterness could pass, let it pass. But not my will, but yours. What the wise men believed, they gave. What you believe about God is represented in what you're willing to give to him. It's not about money. It's about what you're willing to pour out of your treasure box. I find it interesting that those terminology was used because the Bible says they opened their treasure boxes. The things that were treasures to them. The things that mattered to them. That's why you can't harp on whether or not it's money or it's talent or it's gifts or it's time. Because not everyone treasures the same things. For somebody to give an hour is to give a huge treasure. For someone to give 5,000 pounds is a treasure. For others to give something to someone who doesn't have it is a treasure. But when they showed up, their belief system was solidified by what they gave. They saw him as king, they saw him as priest, and they saw him as the crucified God. Here's the key. They saw all that in a baby. They saw all that in a baby. You want to know what it means to operate in wisdom in the earth today? When you can get it in seed form and still worship it as if it was the full-grown oak tree. That you can see it in its infancy and still honor God as if it had delivered everything you believed it would do. That is when you know you're wise. When everything doesn't have to unfold exactly like you see it in order for you to know he's good for it. They saw him as the king he had not but become, the priest who had not yet sacrificed, the man who had not yet died. But their gift giving indicated they knew it was in him. They knew it was in him. As we go into Advent, we're in the middle of it now. I'm asking you to once again evaluate. If you find what you're looking for this season, what, what will it reveal about you? What will it indicate about what you believe is possible? Because God only brought something full grown one time in Genesis. Everything else he gives to you and I in seed form. Everything. Everything. And if you don't learn to see inside the seed, you will always misplace the treasure. You got to see in the seed. You got to be able to look in the manger and still see the king. You got to be able to see the priest who died for you. You got to see the cross and the resurrection.